Kia ora, my name's Jane Yee and welcome to This Is Kiwi. This season, we're talking to six remarkable Kiwi who represent a new generation that's using the power of passion to unlock financial freedom. Now, imagine this. One day, your job as an actor involves you driving around the schools of Aotearoa and you're putting on an educational performance with a couple of castmates, all three of you doing double duty as crew as well. And then your next gig? A lead role in a mega-budget Netflix series that goes to the top 10 charts in nearly 100 countries. It sounds like an implausible dream come true, but that's exactly how it happened for our guest today, Jess Hong, who plays the role of Jin Cheng in the sci-fi blockbuster Three Body Problem. Now, safe to say, Jess's life has changed quite a lot in the last three years, but the core of who she is remains the same, and it's the key to her career success and financial empowerment. We have the pleasure now of learning more with Jess Hong on This Is Kiwi. Jess Hong, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to speak to you and I feel like maybe your life is an alternate dimension right now compared (laughs) to what it was. Nice choice of words. (laughs) Thank you, like like five years ago. (laughs) We're going to talk a lot today about um, what makes you you, what makes you tick, about your success in Hollywood, about your life uh, in Aotearoa, and also a little bit about money, because money makes the world go round, all yeah. of that kind of stuff, but it's really important to have financial empowerment, Mm-mm. and uh, and I think you've done something we all dream of doing, which is following your passion and turning it into a career and something that can empower you financially as well. Uh. Um, it's actually your turn to talk now, so <laughs> let's get to know you. Like, if you could sum yourself up, if I were to walk up to you in a bar and say, who is Jess Hong? Oh, What would you say? Uh, let's see. Okay. I was born and raised in Palmerston North, in Mono 2, represent. And uh, I am a dog on the Chinese Zodiac. I am a Libra. Uh, I know that I am very idealistic when it comes to the world. Uh, but then very pragmatic with a lot of kind of my day-to-day things. Um, I, I am someone that uh, focuses intently when I have something that I care about, but otherwise I procrastinate quite a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can relate. Yeah. I can relate on several levels. Now, you're, you're a Hollywood actor, like quite quite a big-time Hollywood actor now. Like this is the whole thing. I know it's you see you've got that humble Kiwi thing happening yeah. where you're like I know it to be true but I don't really want to like scream and brag about it. It's weird because I've just done this one thing, you know. So it is it does feel strange to kind of claim that space. I'm claiming it for you. All right, because this one this one thing <laughs> well, as as New Zealanders we love nothing more than to celebrate our international yeah, successes. True. So we celebrate you, and this one thing that you've done is quite a big thing, and I'm so curious about the leap that you made from doing theatre around schools <laughs> straight into like a Hollywood blockbuster TV series for yeah. Netflix. It was pretty wild because when I auditioned for this role, I was, it was 2021, like post pandemic slash in the middle of some lockdowns. And I was doing a kids show touring around New Zealand with Duffy Books and Homes. And uh, it was very spiritually fulfilling, but it was like super uh, rough and tumble kind of the three actors that performed in it. We were also the crew and the managers and everything. Um, so we just drove around from from town to town trying to empower children. And then meanwhile, I'm doing these self-tapes and sending them off. And then suddenly these big time producers want to meet me on Zoom. And then they're putting me through the ringer over and over again. And all the way, I'm just thinking, okay, wow, I've already made it to like the fourth round. It's so nice to make this far and it's not going to go anywhere. And then I got the call in uh, mm, August. Yeah, August. Oh my gosh. Um, saying, hey, do you want to come to London in a few weeks and shoot with us? <laughs> and I was like, hell yeah. Uh, so it was pretty wild. It just kind of happened. How did they find you? Because there are there are a lot of actors in the world, and I yeah. definitely don't want to belittle how amazing an actor you are. But, <laughs> you know, we're talking about the bottom end of the world. Mm. How do they find you? Satellite imagery. 
No. Um, uh, just a big old search. They uh, searched every other continent first, and then <laughs> I think they did finally make it over here. It's funny, right? You just mentioned that Kiwi humility thing, and we think we're at the bottom of the world, but that's just because of the map mm. that's been drawn like that. We're just like a part of the world. There happens to be a lot of ocean around us. Um, and it's because I think uh, Dan and David and Alex Wu, they all have their own uh, presence in the industry already. They mm -hmm. all are names in themselves, which is quite unique, I think, for writers and producers. And because of that, they didn't need to immediately hire just like big names. So they could afford to go and search in the corners of the world for someone totally unknown, as long as she fit the part. So there's a lot of luck involved in this as well. But hard work too, because it sounds like quite a yeah. rigorous audition process. Yeah. What does an audition process look like for a show like this? Uh, in this case, there was the initial self-tapes, uh, and then a callback self-tape. And then they actually wanted to meet me. They wanted to fly me to LA to meet me, but because of the pandemic, I wouldn't have been able to get back into the country. So they met me on Zoom. And then to be extra thorough, they gave me a session with the casting directors over Zoom where I did another scene. I did a chemistry read with one of the actors. I did two more scenes independently. I met with them again. I did a chemistry read with another actor. And then finally after that, they were like, hey, you know what? We're going we're gonna to take a chance on you. This is a dream come true for you know, hopefully you, but it would be a dream come true for many, many people. Mm. Was it a childhood dream for you to be, you know, on the world stage? Mm, not at all. I was so socially anxious when I was growing up. I was so shy that I couldn't even like look someone in the eyes and I couldn't hold a conversation. So uh, I definitely never pictured that. I thought I would be like a hermit novelist or poet, you know, by this point. That's the way things were going anyway. And then to challenge myself, I took drama as like a confidence-boosting thing um, and didn't expect that it would be something that I'd get hooked onto and <laughs> devote like so much of myself to. What but, age were you when you started drama classes? Uh, so I did six months at the start of high school and I was not ready for it then, so I quit immediately. And then I did, when I was 17, I felt like I have, gained some confidence. So I, my last year of high school, I joined like the full drama program. Um, and then just continued from there. So yeah, 17, I'd say is when it properly started. It's really interesting to me that as a young teenager, when you first kind of put yourself into drama class, that you had the presence of mind to think about challenging yourself. That's, that's quite an unusual trait, I think. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about Three Body Problem. Tell us a little bit about what the show. <laughs> the first five minutes of the show are really intense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole show is really intense, mm. but that, that first five minutes is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, when you read the script, what were you, you know, what were you thinking? What did you know about the show when you were auditioning for it? Oh, I didn't know anything about it. It was still called Untitled Benioff, so <laughs> I didn't realise what it was until they actually, until I booked the role. And they were like, oh, it's based on these books. And I went, oh, I've got to download all the books on the Kindle now. <laughs> Um, and then reading the scripts, I was just kind of alone in my room at night and I felt myself totally compelled just by the writing. So I was laughing and crying and gasping and just everything was so intense just on the page. And I knew, oh my gosh, this is something really of high quality. Um, and those are just the draft scripts, you know, a lot changed along the way, but then I tried to read concurrently the the first book while I was learning the scripts and I kept getting confused because I was like, <laughs> oh, but what about when this scene comes up and that character comes in? And they're like, Jess, what are you talking about? That's not in the script. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so that's right. Tell me about your character. <clears throat> and uh, how much of Jess you bring to the character? Oh, a lot. Uh, I play Jin Chang, who's... Uh, particle physicist and a genius of her generation. So she is someone that's kind of pioneering her generation in STEM. And no, I'm not the genius part, but uh, I do believe, or I've, I've come to learn about her, that she's quite an idealist as well and um, very optimistic about 
what we can achieve once we know the answers to things and how much of this world we can understand. So I do relate to that quite a bit. And I think the reason they cast me is because there is something of, like, there's intelligence there, but at the heart of it, she actually wrote, is ruled by instinct, and she just kind of follows her gut immediately. Um, she wears her heart on her sleeve as well, even if she doesn't realize it. And she's someone that I think can gather people to her cause, um, which is really cool. And I am a campaigner, according to the 16 personality test. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'd be friends with her? I would love to. I feel like, I don't know if she'd have time for someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> She's not a procrastinator. <laughs> She's not a procrastinator. Um, and I don't know if, I mean, it would be cool to hang out with her. <laughs> Well, maybe in one dimension. Yeah, or I just don't know how I can assist her in saving the world, that's all. <laughs> you can just be her hype girl. Yeah, okay, you I'll be her cheerleader. You can get her coffees, you yeah, know. Yeah, 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 <laughs> keen, keen. What was it like with your family um, when you started getting into drama? Do you have, uh, you know, <laughs> did they have career aspirations for you at all? No, they were, I think several people reminded me that, you know, you can go into teaching, right? <laughs> or, yeah offered alternatives. Um, but my sisters were really supportive, actually. They would always come to my community theatre shows, you know, Summer Shakespeare in the Park. And then when I got into drama school in Poneke, they actually, um, I think that's when they realised that I'm actually serious about this. Like, oh, she's going to pay to study this thing. Um, and a real touching moment was when my one sister was dropping me off somewhere. And totally out of character she just says by the way I'm really proud of you I'm like what because my family doesn't say stuff like that you know no nor does mine <laughs> um so yeah that was that was very heartwarming so I feel like they have been supportive all along the way um and then my mom's just like be careful and take care of yourself that's just a mum being a mum though yeah like, exactly that's literally her job yeah to you know protect you Keep yeah. a little chucky safe. So I feel lucky no one's tried to force me to do anything else. Yeah. I have very similar. Um, my dad's Chinese, my mum's British, but they I have very similar, you know, when I was getting into kind of the entertainment industry, very much like, oh, that's great. Just but, the, and you know, if it doesn't <laughs> if it doesn't work out, mm. you'd make a great teacher or a lawyer or, you know. They were never silly enough to think I could do medicine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was you. Know, you just said before that moment that uh, your sister said she was proud of you, and mm. that's something that has stuck with you. And I, you know, I personally believe words can be so so powerful. And I think it's a good reminder to tell the people that we're proud of that we're proud of them because it can, you know, it can really make a significant difference to their mindset. Truly, truly, there's some people that really believed in me along the way. And actually, the first one was my intermediate form teacher, uh, Mr. McPhail. He just like, this is when I was still writing and thinking that that's what I was going to do. Um, he just like really bolstered me up and told me that my writing's great uh, and that I should just do what I want. And that was really special because no one had ever looked at me before, you know. Yeah, that's, I mean, we all have one of those teachers, eh? Yeah. We, always, we all have a Mr. McPhail who's like that person who who said something and probably didn't realise the impact that they were having on a, on a kid. It's pretty awesome. Maybe I should go into teaching. Um, <laughs> you got time for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have any detractors at all along the way? Like people? Yeah. Did you have any people who were kind of like, mm. it's great that you're doing these auditions, um, but don't get your hopes up kind of thing? Oh, uh, my dad. <laughs> reminded me at every opportunity. Um, Perhaps not so much a detractor as he's just keeping you grounded. Mm, no, he really wanted me to become a teacher. Right. He, like, yeah, did, like, research and tried to um, sway my decision. But he lives in China, so <laughs> he can't really do much on that. Has he seen the show? I don't think so. I don't think he uses a VPN, which is what you'd have to use to watch what? the show. Right, right. <laughs> but he's aware, obviously. He's aware. Got he's yeah. aware. I've, I've, Yeah. Who was seen on the updates? Who was the first person you told when you found out that you'd got the role? Oh, my flatmate was in the room with me, so he heard me screaming and running around the house, and he was like, "Did you get it?" I was like, "No, no, no, no!" 
That's so cool. Well, did you try to remain chill on the phone, or was it a phone call? Yeah, but not at all. Oh. I, I was too, I was too overwhelmed. Good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I broke their eardrum. Let's get back to the show, though. If you can give us a, like a, a a tough show to sum up, but if you could kind of sum it up, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, Three Body Problem is a philosophical sci-fi that explores humanity's varied response to an existential crisis or threat um, spurred on by a decision that one scientist makes in the 1960s China and then fast forwarding into present day where a group of young brilliant scientists are trying to uh, solve the problem for the future generations. Something like that. So Three Body Problem went to the top 10 in 93 countries. Oh, nice. That's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's proper. That's So when I say, you know, like big time, that's proper world stage stuff. Yeah. Um, what's it like being back in Aotearoa after, you know, oh, experiencing so the, nice. the wildness of Hollywood? <laughs> it's so nice. Oh, someone asked me recently, do you – is it possible to get sick of, like, flying around the world? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. Because the jet lag is very real. Yeah. And it kind of accumulates, uh, especially when it's a lot of travel in a, in a short amount of time. And just this year, there's been quite a lot of travel. <laughs> so I, it's always a relief to come home and just be like, ah, oh, Aotearoa. That nice, clean horizon. Oh, listen to those birds. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of great TV production um, and film production that happens in Aotearoa and some really big impact that that we've had is um, this lovely, lovely little country that's not at the bottom of the world, it's just that's where it is on the map. But there's got to be quite a difference between working, you know, on set uh, here in Aotearoa and mm. then working on set in London on mm. this, this huge, huge show. Yeah. So what are some of the things that kind of... I don't know, surprised you? Were you starstruck? Mm. Or, you know, did you ever walk in and sit and go, how, how, how did this happen? Why? Oh, yeah, I think I felt that that way like every day for the first couple months because <laughs> uh, the scale is the the kind of the main difference, the difference in resource and the difference in uh, like manpower and just how many you, you arrive to this big kind of plot um, with the studios and then you go to whichever, you go to your base, you get ready, and then you go to whichever studio you're shooting at that day. And it's a huge warehouse. Um, and there are hundreds of people there all wearing masks because it was still COVID times. And they all know your name. And you're just like, wow, it's my first day. You all know my name. This is weird. <laughs> uh, whereabouts do you travel? Like, you know, you're here, you're home, you're in yeah. Aotearoa at the moment, but where has your work taken you? Uh, mainly to LA. That's where m most of the press has been. A um, little bit in London again, which is where we shot most of those nine months. Uh, I actually just got back from a holiday in Korea with my two friends, so that one was just me. I mean, you know, sitting here with you, you seem very much like a regular Kiwi um, how does a regular Kiwi go down in Hollywood, you know? Like, do you bring – is there, like, a kind of a Hollywood version of Jess or is this just <laughs> exactly as you are now is exactly what they get to? Uh, yeah, this is pretty much it. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe people are disappointed, but I don't care. Why would they be disappointed? <laughs> they wrote your accent. You know, they change things, right? So you Yeah, that's true. Accent, so. I do think people are fascinated by the accent and kind of my chill vibes, my uh, – my boss described me as like a, like a, you know, a chill, like surfer chick. And I went, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> I don't surf, but cool. <laughs> hey, look, you can be whatever you want to be, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, your character's a physicist. What do you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it physics? Is that what I say? What do you know about physics? Phys yeah. Phys yeah. I mean, it's how the world works, right? So it's, there's some basic things I remember from school. Levers. Levers. Pulleys, fulcrums. <laughs> um, what do you call it? Action, reaction, la la la. There is, I try to do a tiny bit of research. I like read this book called The Hidden Reality by Brian Greene about parallel universes. And um, I watched a bunch of his, his talks on YouTube as well. 
I listen to a podcast called The Infinite Monkey Cage, which is a really good, it's a comedian and a scientist talking together about the world. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm playing a person. So I just needed to understand basically what she was talking about in the scripts. And then I was like, okay, I'll just I'll leave it at that because that's already doing my head. <laughs> is it fun though? Because I used to watch Star Trek and they would talk about like, thrust blasters and, put, you know, very seriously kind of talk about oh. the stuff that I didn't understand and was all made up. And I was right. kind of like, it looks like so much fun to kind of just like dig into into a script that's almost yeah, like, I it's guess, not nonsense, but it was to me, you know? Well, the science that Jen is talking about is real science, no, like hard science. So it's not... Um, it's not Star Trek. It's not like, because I watched Doctor Who growing up and that was... Um, I feel the same kind of enjoyment from watching that, but, uh, yeah, no, in terms of her, the closest I can compare it to is, uh, cause I've done a bunch of Shakespeare plays is it kind of like that. You're speaking English, mm. but you're not really <laughs> speaking a language you understand. Yeah. So I did have to do at least a little bit of research into obviously the three body problem mm. as a scientific problem. And, um, do my best to understand it in a way that I could visualize or or feel or, yeah, compare to the world. Um, and then when I deliver it, hopefully it makes sense too. Well, I think you did an amazing job. And it's kind of, I guess, that um, just having that enough knowledge to have that confidence so that when you're saying it, it sounds convincing to everyone else. What do you do in terms of, you know, escapism for your own enjoyment? Because your life has been mm. really busy. Mm. Uh, a lot of us turn to entertainment, but you work in entertainment. Do you do something? Yeah. Do you like do I don't know? Look yeah, at, look at spreadsheets or something. You're on the money. Uh, well, not with the spreadsheets. <laughs> I I watch anime, and uh, that's kind of my best way to zone out because it's entertainment still, but it's not like where I work. Yeah, because you can't help but watching stuff and analyzing it. <laughs> so, um, although I did just finish binging Shogun, finally, that was oh. Amazing. But it took me a while because anytime there's a show that I care about and want to like really invest in mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally, it takes me a while to get around to it if I'm tired. Yeah. So when I'm super exhausted and I just need something to zone out to, then it's anime. anime series. What's your, what's your favorite? Oh, I just watched one called Free Run Beyond Journey's End. It's really beautiful. It's like almost like a slice of life fantasy about this elf reflecting on her past. <sighs> Cute. Yeah. You've talked a little bit about being an idealist and a pragmatist, which is kind of a, a dream combo because you can have the hope, but you also have reason. Mm. <laughs> um, it's a tough time to be an idealist. Mm. So what is it? Has, has that always been in you? What is it about you that, you know, thinks that there's hope? Mm. Hope was a survival method for me when I was younger. Um, because I was so shy and I wanted to boost my confidence, hope was the only thing that kept me pushing myself because I couldn't imagine the future where I was a confident, um, optimistic person. I was also a pessimist as well. I used to be super jaded for no reason when I was like 11. <laughs> like, yeah, the world sucks. I'm a nihilist. But then oh, at some point you got to move forward. Or you just got to move, right? And hope is one of those instigators of movement. Um, so it's more like a tactic for me. And then it's something that I embedded into my kind of approach to life very early on. And now it's just there. Um, and it's served me well in terms of like, I've gone into places where I never even imagined. I didn't think I would even go to drama school. I didn't even know drama school existed <laughs> until I was like 18. And the fact that I could hope for something more than whatever I was living at the time was enough to keep me moving forward and pushing through challenges. And then, yeah, then I would be able to walk through the world with my eyes open and notice opportunities as they came up instead of what I used to do when I was younger, which is walk on the street with my eyes down on the ground. So it's there's a literal metaphor there of, of walking through the world with your eyes up and like open and ready to receive. 
Um, so I think that's what hope does or, or allows you to kind of access that open vision. What would you like people who are listening to know and understand about what it is to be painfully shy? Because we don't hear from the painfully shy very often. Yeah. Um, it's not about you. <laughs> it's uh, talking from the painfully shy person's point of view. It's not about you. I'm not upset. Uh, I do want to get to know you. That's just really hard for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to stand in the corner of the room. I'm sorry. Um, now, Jess, What's a common misconception that people have about you? Mm. Do you have people like people have made assumptions about you, um, either at home in your personal life or I mean, the main abroad? thing is that I've always been confident. I think right. people just assume that I'm I've always naturally just been an extrovert, which is not true. I had to work at that. Yeah, for a long time. How far in <laughs> advance do you plan? Um, I'm curious because I used to go like. Here's the twenty year plan, and Ooh. then and then you know, things changed that were beyond my control, yeah. and some were within my control. I just changed my mind about things, and I now plan the week if I'm lucky in advance. You know, yeah, the week is good for me too. I also uh, my calendar is color coordinated and all very nice, so um, quite proud of it actually. And so I can plan out my month if I know there are certain events coming up, then. I'll have those and then I can kind of curate whatever my life is around those events. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know as an actor that you just can't plan mm. very much in advance. I do have goals though. I do have like, it'll be nice within my 30s to start the journey towards being a director because I would really much, very much like to go towards that. Um, and I want to gather enough resource so that I can buy my sister and my mum a house. And then me after. So, yeah, those are my long-term goals. I don't have a time limit on them. Just within this time, it might be nice too. Yeah. Why is it so important for you to help out your sister and your mum ahead of yourself? Oh, they've just done so much for me, you know. Like my mum gave up her just like being connected to her entire family and came to this very strange new place with its backwards customs and raised three kids by herself, you know? That's wild. <laughs> the sacrifices she made is um, it's quite overwhelming to think about. And then my sister, I have two sisters older than me, and they both kind of half raised me while mum was at work or, you know, different things. And they had to give up their kind of youth because they were busy taking care of me mm. and they had to grow up very fast and be adults when they were still in high school. So, yeah, it would be nice if I could repay them in some way. Well, I hope that, you know, you're on a good path. I imagine that a three-body problem paycheck is probably a little bit more than the school theatre tour. A little bit more. A little yeah, bit more. Just slightly. <laughs> <laughs> have you had an aha moment in your career? Uh, there have been so many of moments where something a teacher said like five years ago would click into place wow. while I'm at work or, or when something's happening. But I can't pinpoint, I can't remember the specifics of what that was. It's just that learning takes a while to settle and mm, it takes a while to realize the things that you were kind of pulling your hair out about at school or even just when you were being directed by someone. Um, so there's many of them. Yeah, it's just hard to remember exactly what they were. <laughs> <laughs> many an aha moment. Many an aha moment. Um, acting, especially when you're starting out, notoriously doesn't really pay the bill. So what are some other jobs that you've had along the way? I was barista for six months. I was a retail assistant for five years. I was a host, what do you call it? Uh, an usher in Poneke or through drama school. So three years. Um, yeah, I've done random, like, front of house hospo bits. I worked, like, six shifts at, uh, that, that steakhouse on Wellesley Street, the, uh, Tony's, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a classic. It's, like, um, a classic one where a lot of actors have worked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And all of this, you have to. I mean, you know, we all we've all been there. We've all had our um our list, our CV of of jobs that we probably wouldn't necessarily include on the CV, and jobs that we would. Um, <laughs> but you know, you got to you got to do what you got to do to pay the rent. But tell me about your relationship with money um, as a child. Like, if you compare to like five to you know fifteen, twenty five. Oh, yeah. You know, what, what, what's the different phases of your relationship with money been? I can't remember five, but um, <laughs> there was, for some reason, and I don't know why I remember this either, someone at primary school was asking, how much is your rent? And then I was like, I don't know, it's a lot, like maybe $20. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I know. I thought $20 was... Yeah, heaps back then. But that's when we used to have those five cent lollies, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, that was like primary school age and then going into high school. Actually, I did a budgeting, one of those six-month budgeting courses in high school. Um, I don't know if you ever had that. We could do modules where you could try the different things. So I did six months in drama, which failed. And then I did six months of budgeting. Uh, and I remember nothing except for... When you market something, you want to put it as like five ninety nine as opposed to six dollars, stuff like that. Psychological, yeah, just being under the six yeah, yeah. instead of over. But from there, I started writing down like a weekly budget. Not that I had anything to spend because I didn't get an allowance. My whole family would never received an allowance. But um, in my first and second year of high school, I did visit China. Um, and I received some yuan mm. from there. And then I would like store it all away. And then every now and then I would take 100 yuan to the bank and I would get, receive $20 in New Zealand D. And um, that was amazing. So the, I would write, physically write budgets for my $20. Well, that's a week's rent, you know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was rolling in it. <laughs> so you were kind of... Even if you weren't aware that you were aware of money, you were aware of it. And I'm guessing with yeah. your with your mum, you know, working, raising three daughters um, on her own, were there conversations about having to save? And you know, you mentioned the rice. Mm, no, no, not specific money conversations. Not specific money conversations. Not many conversations generally. <laughs> My household, we were pretty quiet. Um, uh, my sisters, though, they started working when they were like 15, 16 years old. Mm. So um, I think through observing them and what they would say to me, then I kind of realized the value of what we had. And also I observed that most of my friends either had an allowance and could like have things. And it was just interesting to notice the difference between like our family where I always wore hand-me-down clothes to like Mufti Day and... We didn't have any allowance and um, we couldn't have like the latest Tamagotchi or whatever. Um, and then seeing the difference with other families that could have those things. I was like, oh, so there are some that have and there's some that have not. Right. So I, I realized that really early on. Yeah. Um, and that made me, I think, have a real appreciation for things when I finally did get a job um, in retail. <laughs> then I was like, oh, my gosh, I can like buy stuff. I can have my own clothes. And it's stuff that I worked for as well. Um, so that was really cool. A lot of people will go down one of two paths when you have kind of this, you know, this childhood where you're looking and seeing other people that, you know, the haves and the have-nots, as you said. Um, they'll either go, okay, I'm used to saving, I'm used to saving for a rainy mm -hmm. day and scrimping and, you know, or they'll go, Oh, I've got money now. I can spend mm. it. I'm gonna spend it on all the things. And there's obviously a spectrum in between. Where do you lie on that? Uh I feel like I've somehow landed in the middle-ish, which is shocking actually. Because um my I'm usually a really impulsive person, so it's quite amazing that I've managed to re retain some rationale. Um but I think that's because my sisters are very, very much the saving type. They would receive chocolate on Easter and the chocolate would still be in the fridge next Easter. Like I have two children like that and then oh. I have the one who eats all of it. And God. then I'm that other child. Yeah. I would have, like, <laughs> we had to sell chocolate for school, the school, what do you call it? The Why fundraisers. The fundraisers. 
and I would eat a box before I sold anything. That was so bad. <laughs> Got told off real bad. But um, You're eating your profits. <laughs> yeah, I literally am eating my profits. There was no delayed gratification for me <laughs> back then. Um, but I think I've kind of leveled my head a little bit. And so, yeah, when I was working on Three Body, I was like, oh my God, this is more income than I've ever received in my entire life. This is wild. But you have to save it for a rainy day. And that's also something you build as an actor or an artist of any kind. You know that as a contractor, you receive a lump sum payment, but that's not just for that time. That's also for all the weeks or potentially months before you find another job after that. So you just always have, mm, I guess, this habit of saving everything because you know that there'll be a dry time where you needed to lock into it. It's really interesting because my um, I went through a marriage breakup a few years ago, which left mm. us both, you know, financially not as, you know, not as well off as we were as a unit together. And it's, I kind of look back now and think about all the things that I felt like were needs and that I'd become accustomed to because I had the resources. And then when I had to tighten my belt a lot, it was a little bit of a shock to the system. And I feel like maybe being an actor, is that's kind of what life is like. All the time, if you're Feast not careful. Famine, yeah. The classic phrase. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think so. And I think that's why I'm like, maybe I should go to a country where I don't speak the language because there will be a total shock to the system. <laughs> Stop me from being comfortable <laughs> buying like full cream instead of, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Tell me about a time that money's unlocked something for you. Oh, uh. My recent trip to South Korea <laughs> unlocked some good times and some bonding with my friends. Do you have an appreciation of how it's important to like include experiences as well as things? Yeah, uh, into you know into when you're budgeting. Oh, I prioritize experience over things. Um, I say that I do shop quite a bit, but I shop at op shops. Um, and you probably enjoy the experience of the thrill I of finding it. a bargain at an op shop. Yeah, oh, I love it. I'm that weird person who like will buy a $50 coat but then goes to the supermarket and goes, oh, my God, the chips were $3 and now they're two fifty. Wow. I'm still <laughs> – I don't know why we're always like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just – I like the idea that I'm not a victim of capitalism but I'm, like, taking advantage of it or I'm, like, a <laughs> You're secret You're manipulating agent. capitalism. It's yeah, not manipulating it's you. It's a total um, – <laughs> It's a total illusion, but it's one that I like to keep putting myself under. But there's no denying that, uh, obviously, having control over your own financial situation is a freedom. Mm. It's a privilege, but it's something that we can all aim for. Yeah. Actually, now that you mention it, uh, after doing Three Body, that was the first time I felt like I really had true financial freedom in my life. Mm. There have been times where during a project I have that financial freedom, but I know that I'm not saving enough to continue having it afterwards. So, yeah, it's been it's been quite a miracle for me. But you're a budgeter and that probably helps. Yeah, true. <laughs> I love that you're a budgeter. I'll make it stretch <laughs> like a pancake. What is in your budget list that you can't live without? Mm, chocolate. Like Chocolate's always going to have a line in the budget. Uh, or some some treat. I think it's good to have one treat, you know, because you, you just need to have a break from all the, the strict stuff. Well, okay, my, my flatmate um, tends to the garden in our place, so we have actually, like, fresh vegetables quite often. Um, and then it's just a case of bolstering up all of that. With chocolate. And oat With milk. chocolate and oat milk oh, it's like and they're, rice. They're like the four main food groups there, exactly. right? Like stuff from your garden, chocolate, oat milk and rice. <laughs> oh, rice and um, instant ramen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Either shin ramen or there's the good old megaring that got me through kind of student days. Is that the, um, the like the the blue packet? Yeah. The, yeah. There's blue, there's yeah. yellow, I think. The Indomie. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a staple in our house as well. <laughs> um, there you go. People probably didn't know they were coming here for instant ramen recommendations. Yeah. Actually, if you're after cheap 
but like still feels good. A classic kind of instant noodle with those, you know, packets of baby spinach or whatever. And then an egg on top. Yes, see? see? An instant ramen doesn't have to look at the picture elevate. on the packet and elevate. Elevate your budget eating, fam. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> Oh, um, if you could sum up the experiences leading up to your success in just one word, what would that word be? Practice. Damn. One word's really hard. One word is really, <laughs> really hard. I mean, you can feel free to expand on that as to why you chose that word. Well, I was about to say preparation, but um, there's actually just practicing the things that you want to do and the things that you like to do, uh, that's how I kind of got here. Um, and wrapped up inside that is that I'm just passionate about acting, and that's why I've always pursued it. But um, you have to keep doing a thing over and over again in order to get good at it. It's like a total misconception that there are like geniuses that can just walk in and do something. I don't believe that at all. I think you have to work hard to do the thing that you want to do. And because you want to do it, you will work hard at the thing. And it's it's just awesome that you can do that with something that you're passionate about. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah, unlock that financial freedom. I love it. You've talked about hard work and you've talked about practicing as being a key, you know, a key um, summary, I guess, of mm -hmm. how you've achieved what you've achieved. But what does that look like on a practical level? Because I feel like sometimes you can say these things like practice, mm. practice, practice. But what does that actually look like for you? Um, so back when I still lived in Palmy, uh, I did a bunch of community theatre. And that's where you don't get paid and you volunteer your time. And luckily I was just in retail. So I actually had time and evenings to commit to this. And I did that for two years. Um, I also did a... Diploma in Performing Arts, which is a full-on year intensive. And, and then I did three years studying at Toifkari. And so I'm lucky because I would I would then put myself in a situation where I had the resources and the environment to practice every day. And I think I was the kind of nerdy student that, let's say we are working on a project at school and everyone leaves at 8 p.m. and I'm still there in the basement at 10 p.m. <laughs> going over and over and over a thing until it's maybe too much. People did tell me to calm down in drama school. Um, uh, what do you say to them now? Well, I say you're right because I was too tense. <laughs> but after having calmed down, I still think I have managed to retain that sense of it's now or never, you know, just put in that little extra hour. Maybe just come like half an hour early. Just do it. There's no reason not to put everything into this. Let's say there's um, a self-tape audition I want to complete. And actually I'm doing one tomorrow, so this is a good one. Um, you, you learn your lines, obviously, and there's the base things that you need to do. And you get a reader and you go into a, a space, you record it and edit it. It could just be that. But you could also go imagine yourself playing that role. You could also maybe create a slight backstory. You could also talk to your friends about it in the room and use up that entire hour of time if you've booked a studio. Um, there's a lot of ways to extend even the smallest bit of work. Mm. Um, so I think it's about not being okay with just the the bare minimum but going above and beyond just staying as long as you can stay and just going over that mm, that rehearsal one more time just in case yeah just in case there's no reason not to. just one more time you don't have to one more it's not gonna hurt <laughs> all right Jess Hong are you ready for your quick fire questions <laughs> okay. okay what are you saving for I'm saving for a house for my sister, a house for my mum, and a house for me. Nice. Just three houses, that's all. <laughs> yeah, just casually. <laughs> Might take a while. What was your first big purchase? Ah, it was uh, my <laughs> learner's license registration. <laughs> <laughs> that is adorable. When I was 16, yeah. What's your go-to treat? 
Oh, at the moment, Whitaker's dark salted caramel chocolate. Interesting. Mm. What brings you joy? Mm, seeing my friends smile. That's so simple, right? Yeah. So nice. And what's the last thing you splurged on? It was in Korea and it was like a spa, like fancy spa day for me and my two friends. I'm, I'm going to ask you one final question before we wrap up. If there was one thing Kiwi could do this week to work towards achieving their goals, what would you suggest that thing be? I think that everyone should go take a walk and think about what really matters to them and prioritise that thing. It's like simple and may seem obvious, but we don't do that enough. Yeah. That's really good advice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess. It's been such a pleasure chatting Thank with you. you. We've gone for ages and ages, but um, it's been, yeah, it's just been such a pleasure. And yes, you're again. doing awesome. And I just wish you all the very best for the future and can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Oh, you too. I'm here. This is Knowledge for Better. This is Jess Hong. This is Kiwi. Mm-hmm. 